Okay, so we're here today with Diane Holden, and she's going to tell us her experience with um, uh, foster care. And Diane, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself. And sure. Uh, my name is Diana Holden. I'm 36 years of age. I'm an author from Abbotsford, British Columbia, and I grew up in foster care the majority of my life. Uh, from the age of three until 19, I was um, in 23 different homes um, that were run by the provincial government, Ministry for Children and Families. Um, and I was physically and sexually abused in several of the homes. And uh, these homes were never shut down. And some of them are in still operation today. What was your first complaint? Uh, my first complaint was when I was three. I was in a foster home until I was five. And I was sexually abused by the foster mother. And I was also found drunk running around the streets of Vancouver and only a di in a diaper when I was four. Um, my biggest complaints about being in foster care was that when you make a complaint to a social worker about the abuse that's taking place in the home, um, they don't believe you. Um, they stereotype children that are in foster care and they state, well, because this person's in foster care, they're not to be believed. So whenever I would make a complaint, uh, it would fall on deaf ears. Um, the other issue was um, you go to the police and make a complaint about what was going on, they too would not uh, investigate and they would take the assumption that because you're in foster care that you're lying and you're not telling the truth about what's going on. Um, what was unique about it is when I interviewed uh, Minister Mary Pollock for my book Daughter's Choice, which was the book about me growing up in foster care, um, she stated the number one complaint by children in care was that they didn't like the bed that they were sleeping in, they didn't like the food that they were being served, so they would make allegations of abuse. And to that I disagree because majority of kids that are in foster care that are claiming that they're being abused, the abuse is coming from either the caregiver themselves or it's coming by uh, other children that are in the foster care system uh, living with you in the, in the residence. Like I was sexually abused by other uh, kids in the group home. Um, one home would make us run like a 10 mile run uh, if we misbehaved, they'd lock us outside in minus 40 below weather to shovel snow. Um, it was horrendous, the amount of abuse that took place while I was in government care. And when you complain about it, nothing was ever done. One of the homes that I was in eventually did get shut down. One out of 23 homes? Yes. It's amazing. It was absolutely um, astonishing how these homes could still stay in operation and there was no accountability when it came to uh, the people that were abusing me. So you've actually launched a lawsuit. Yes, I have. With respect to that. I, with respect to that, yes. I, um, I have a lawyer that's acting on my behalf. Um, I have sued them for the abuse that took place uh, regarding the sexual abuse while I was in foster care. Um, that case is before the courts in Vancouver Supreme Court Registry. And the outcome looks uh, very, very good because um, the award, there's a lot of pres case precedents with respect to children that have been sexually abused while living in government care. So there's already cases in that are, you know, that are, that will help. Well, Diane, many churches consider foster homes a non-safe place. So what is your comment on that? Um, I disagree with that. I think um, there are some good foster homes. Uh, there are some definitely out there that are good. I have one when I was 17, which was phenomenal, um, but um, not all foster homes are safe. I think that they have the same issues and family dynamics of other families as well. So the argument is they would like to err on the side of caution and place vulnerable children into a non-safe place called foster home, right? Yeah. So usually that is their, their, their position. Okay, do you think that, okay, this serve community, so society and families in need best? No, I think that there, sh I think that, uh, there should be investigations done by the police with respect to before a child is removed. I think that it uh, should have the same force of a trial in the court, like the criminal court system does. I think that they should have to prove that these parents, beyond reasonable doubt, are abusing their children. And I think that the, the power of child removal should be taken away from social workers and should be provided by, um, you know, police departments. I think that it should have that course of, you know, investigation.
information that the police need to be able to do it. Um, because you're getting untrained social workers that are just out of school, and some of them don't even have kids, and they're not trained in the art of investigation. They, you know, and just too many times children were removed for wrongful reasons. And then you have social workers that will falsify records and f provide false testimony in the courts um, just to substantiate their, their removals. And I think that is just absolutely appalling. So what is the, the real motives behind all these? What are they up to? It's money. <laughs> they make money. They make hundreds and hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars. Um, it's totally money, money uh, related. Yeah, but social workers don't earn an extra dime by removing one more kid, so how, how, how would you explain because that? If well, if there's no removals, there's no resources. The resources get paid. If there's no re removals, there's no jobs. So it's a job security issue, right? It, totally. If, if you have a social worker that's not, or that's removing, you know, that doesn't have the power to remove, then there's no jobs. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You're